So first things first, the question posed by the book is, are you a manager or a movement starter? And when I thought about this myself, I was like, well, I'm kind of a bad manager, so I must be a movement <laughs> starter. But I'm pretty sure that's not how it works. Yeah, I, I, I'm not trying to say that managers in and of themselves are bad. Okay. I mean, managers are necessary. And there are awesome managers that are critical to organizations that help people grow their careers, etc. But the way the distinction I'm trying to draw is that managers are people who do the best with what they're given. They say, you know, we're doing everything we can. Mm -hmm. And movement starters are the ones that push beyond the status quo, who say there must be more that we can do, and they find a way to rally people behind them in doing that. So how do you even make the – is it desirable to make the shift? If so, how do you start that process? Because I think most people who are in a management position are not – Maybe I shouldn't speak so soon, but I feel like most people are going, I'm just trying to get by. I'm not trying to be a world changer. That's up in the C-suite. What am I going to do about that? All I have is this small team of 12 people working on an app. So my view is that all of us really can be and potentially are already movement starters. And part of the reason I believe this is because I have been lucky to get to see so many regular people do this. You know, in my job at change.org and my job at Facebook, I see it every day, just regular people who stand up and say, there's something I don't like in the world or in my neighborhood or in my workplace. Why don't I be the person to do something about it? That's all I'm talking about here. Just be the person who tries to change the things that you think need to be changed. Okay, so we can zoom in a lot on that and go... Maybe I do just manage a Starbucks or a car dealership, but I can change the way that customers feel about visiting our store or our shop or the way that this this particular type of problem is handled. Because the, the idea of having like a purpose movement sounds grandiose enough where people are going, look, man, I work at, I work at uh, H&M. Right? What am I? What am I doing here? I'm not going to ever need this. Yes, that's true. I, I think it's all in how we define what the movement is. And as I said, like it can be that you want to get a new course offered at your school, or it can be, as you said, you want your customers to have a better experience mm-hmm. with the brand you work on. It can also be something that is going to change your community or the world. Those things also start small, which I think is sometimes confusing to people. Like they think that you have to just wake up one day and suddenly you're Nelson Mandela. It doesn't happen that way. It happens with regular people who take small steps that become bigger. So a good example is, you know, we're in the middle of this situation with children being separated from their families at the border. There's a couple, Charlotte and Dave Wilner, who started a fundraiser saying, we don't think this is right and we want to do something about it. They started a fundraiser, asked their friends and family. They were trying to raise $1,500. Oh, yeah. You may have seen this in the news. They're almost $20 million. They didn't start out saying, we want to raise $20 million for this issue, right? They took a small step that then rallied other people and became a movement. I I wonder, are they getting charged? How does that work when you do a GoFundMe? Don't they take a percentage of what you raise? This is a Facebook fundraiser, oh, okay. so and we do not take uh, a that's, percentage. That's good of, to know. Yes, exactly. I was going to say, uh-oh, that could backfire nicely. Yeah, and I think, you know, the other thing is, I actually met with them yesterday, and they're now trying to think about how do you actually turn this into more of a movement? Because now you have hundreds of thousands of people who've donated to a cause that they are passionate about. And so now they're thinking, well, maybe we can turn it into a group. How do you get these people to take Mm -hmm. other actions? And that's one of the things I saw about movements too in all the interviews I did and the work I've done is that the first step really almost always leads to some kind of future action. It's like, yeah, people are afraid to take that first step. Right. But once you do it, it's much easier to do everything else. Do you think it's easier to get people to donate money than it is to get them to take an action? Or is that kind of a great way to get people started? Yeah, so there's social organizers use something they call the ladder of engagement, right. right? So you start with a small step and then you ask people to do more and more. Often the small step is really small, like signing a petition is mm-hmm. a good example. Um, but sometimes donating is that first small step. And especially now that it's so easy to donate online, you often have your credit card already there. Sure. And, you know, it might just be $5. It doesn't have to be that you're donating thousands of dollars. That can be a good first step to a movement. How do we 
separate the people that are because i feel like sometimes when i donate to something i can't believe i'm admitting this when i donate to something i'm like i'm off the hook now i gave like eight dollars to save the oceans i can do i have the moral licensing right it's like those people that drive a prius and they throw their mcdonald's bag out the window because they (laughs) drive a prius there's a little bit of moral licensing happening i i'm not that bad obviously but it seems like starting anything keeping that momentum going is a matter of neuroscience plus some sort of fine art yeah. uh, persuasion. It, well, I, what I'd say is that oftentimes those first actions do really lead to mm-hmm. other actions. So at change.org, often we would hear people say, oh, that's just slacktivism. You know, you just yeah. sign something and right. you think that's enough. And But actually almost 50% of people who sign petitions take at least one other action, whether it's sharing with their friends or tweeting to some, you know, to a decision maker or donating money or showing up at an event. So many, many people don't stop at the first action. And then the other thing is there's tips that great movement builders use, like storytelling is Mm -hmm. one that I've seen used super effectively where, you know, people um, like you shared a story with me about someone who, explain that they why they write comedy because right. sometimes people have really tough situations and they need comedic relief that is a story that will resonate with people and next time they see comedy they'll think of that story so movements have the same thing people basically tell a story about why the movement matters to them and there's many stories in purposeful that give that example so you know one that's pretty difficult is a there's a man named Hank Hunt who Um, He had this kind of picture-perfect life. He married his high school sweetheart. They had a few kids. And one day, they really had tragedy strike in their life. And his daughter, Carrie, was um, stabbed to death by her estranged husband in a hotel bathroom. It's really a horrible story. That's not where I sort of expected that to go. Yeah. Okay. and the, But the part of it that's the really the most sad is that her three kids were on the other side of the wall trying to dial 911. And oh, they couldn't get through God. to 911 because you have to dial 9 to get an outside line from a hotel. Oh, and yeah, they don't know that. Exactly. And actually, many adults don't know that either. So um, yeah. Hank, Shoot. who had this tragic situation, basically took that story and said, I'm going to do something about this. I don't want anyone else's children to ever have to go through this situation. And so he started this campaign for what he calls Carrie's Law, which is requiring all businesses to allow direct dial for 911. And he started small, just reached out to his friends, and ultimately got 600,000 people mm-hmm. to sign this petition. And it was just passed into law in January. So, yeah. But it, without that story, sure. just hearing about dialing 911 by itself wouldn't really resonate in the same way. Yeah, of course. You're just thinking, okay, I, I can read the phone says dial 9. Right. I'm just going to dial 9911. No right. big deal. Right. Why do we have to incur all these have these companies incur all these expenses to change their systems and everything. And it's like, exactly. because tragic murder witnessed by grandchildren right? and totally it, avoidable. And there's nothing that right. makes it more real and yeah. resonate more. Than yeah. That. That's now, now you get like angry. Like, how is that already right. a thing? Why do we have to make laws about things like this? Yeah. That's brilliant. So, so how do we find those particular stories? If say I am a manager of a, and I'm picking on Starbucks because I patronize it all the time. So warm up your email for somebody else. But <laughs> I'm just like, I work at Starbucks. How dare you? Uh, how, do, what if I manage a Starbucks? I'm not, it's not that, it's not a life and death situation. Yeah. So what? Some customers come in here and they wait too long or, you know, okay, I just, whatever. I don't have to worry about this. No one's going to care except for me. So right. why try? Yeah. So I think the thing there is trying to think about what, it, what could happen if it were better, right? All movements start with a vision, and a vision is a desired future for what you want the world to look like. And again, it might not be the world. It might be your personal Starbucks. And you might say, what would it look like if every time my loyal customers came in, I knew what they already wanted or, sure. you know, something like that? And yeah. what would – how how would I make that happen? Why does it – so vision has three parts. One is your desired future – Second is a purpose, why it matters to you, that desired future. And three is a story that brings that vision to life, as I just described. And one of the one of my favorite examples, which is also in Purposeful, is um, a woman named Luann Calvert, who was the CMO at Virgin America when it was still a brand. Mm-hmm. And um, 
you know, she had, and this isn't, you know, world changing, but it was really important to their brand and critical to making their brand into a movement. So they had this safety video. I don't know if you remember their original safety video on Virgin America. I don't know if it was the original, but the one with all the dancing? No. So that, so the original one was an animated cartoon, which was really comedic and totally loved by their loyal customers. It had a nun trying to fasten her seatbelt. And it was really, really well liked. And it turned out that it didn't meet the FAA standards. And so Mm. she had to change the video. And she was so worried because everybody loved this video. Like, how was she going to do something that was better than that? And so she said, well, I got to do something that's never been done before. And so she went to to this creative shop they have inside Virgin America and said, we got to do something brand new. And they said, okay, how about a musical rhyming safety video? And she said, yeah, that sounds great. But then she had to persuade all the people inside her organization that this was a good idea. And Mm -hmm. that's what makes it a movement, right? It can't just be my good idea. I have a decision maker, I have to persuade. And Luann did something that I outlined called Social organizers call it power mapping. I prefer the term influence mapping. Okay. Um, but oh, I got you. Yeah. yeah. That does sound a little bit not more A palatable. little gentler. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. Um, so she looked at who she had to persuade, which was in this case the CEO of Virgin America. And she looked at all the people that influence him. And she said, well, it's other executives and it's our flight attendants and it's our loyal customers. And in this case, it's the FAA. And so she went around and took a little bit of extra time to persuade each of those constituents that this was a good idea. And in the final setting where this had to get approved by the CEO, one of the people she had persuaded along the way turned out to be totally critical. So the CEO said... I don't know. It's music. It's probably going to wear on you over time. And the COO, who was brand new to Virgin America, said, nope, I love it. The more you hear it, the more it grows on you. Oh, that's true. And Yeah. Have and you... so he approved it. And like the rest is history. This yeah. video has been watched 13 million times on YouTube. Yeah, I'm one of those right. people because I was like, I've got to get this song out of my head. It's <laughs> in my head. And and I've had more more annoying songs in my head than this in-flight video. I thought it was really cool and creative and I wanted to show my friends this video I saw right. without booking them on a flight to New right. York. So an Brilliant. airline safety video yeah. has been viewed 13 million yeah. times. It's not just a video. It is a safety video. And that helped turn their brand into a movement that people yeah. love. Yeah, that, that video was unbelievable. There's nothing that will make me pay attention on a plane other than probably that video. <laughs> right. Even when they're right in front of you and you're like, crap, I got to not look at my phone for three seconds because now I'm, I mean, right. they're right there. Yes. Like, this is how you put on the mask and I still don't care. My <laughs> life is in the, this is <laughs> life changing, life saving information. That's Can't right. be bothered. I've once been quizzed on the safety because uh, one time on a plane I wasn't completely listening sure. and a flight attendant stopped to say, um, excuse me. You know, where I think she asked me, whose oxygen mask do you put on first? I was like, really? Yeah. You're going to quiz me on the safety video? Did you video? get it right? Well, of course. You okay. couldn't recite, especially after Virgin America. Sure. Now I could sing them the whole safety video, right. actually. So. Yeah, from a competing airline. Yeah, yeah, that would be good. That would be good. Yeah, so I learned from the Virgin America video that I actually pay attention to that <laughs> yes. you always put your own on before helping others. Under your seat, there's a light right. vest. Right. <laughs> I think that video set the bar so much higher for – you saw other companies kind of try to imitate it a little bit. They're like, oh, we'll make ours funny. And you just go, nah. It's kind of like going to Broadway and seeing a really good show. And then you're like watching a high school play and you go, no, it's a good try. <laughs> right. You know, but it's it's not nearly – it's not the same thing. That's um, right. And so Luann was the movement right. starter, right? And if she had just said, well, huh. I'll just do my best and – you know, whatever I can. Especially for something that seems minor. Right. And so the difference is pushing it all the way as far as it could go. So it's obviously better to be a movement starter than just a manager. What Besides vision, what other category, what other sort of characteristics are there that we have to really focus on? Yeah. So vision is the first step. Mm-hmm. The second piece is about taking some action towards that vision. As I said, mm-hmm. you... And sometimes it's scary, but in this case, I liken it to being the first one to stand up and clap in a 
standing ovation. Oh, uh, terrifying. So by the way. exactly, yeah. it's scary. You know, yeah. you're going to be the old, the first one standing. But I ask this sometimes in big audiences of people: How many of you have been the first to stand up and clap? And usually, you get a couple people who have. And mm. then I ask them. How many how many of you have been at a show of any kind where only one person ever stood up? And it's just so rare. Yeah, no. You know, as scary as it is to be the one, like when do you ever see that person just standing by themselves? Well, Someone yeah. gets up with them. You feel like you have to. If right. You, if everyone else or other people are standing and you're sitting, you're like, okay, I, well, right. I did like it. I guess and I'll stand up. That's right. And so this is the second step to starting a movement. So you have your vision. You be the first to stand up. And the, the next thing you do is about embracing your first followers, right? Those next few people to stand up with you, how you treat them, how much you embrace and welcome them is a, has a lot to do with whether your movement will take off. So there's a, a really fantastic TED talk on this topic. Mm-hmm. Derek Sivers. Yes. Have you seen it? He does the one with the guys on the hill dancing. dancing. I was going to say, man. got to put that in your keynote for the book now. It, yeah, yeah. It's uh, already in there. <laughs> yeah. Thank you to Derek Sivers. Great yeah. example. Um, but right, he the so he's shirtless dancing man for anyone who hasn't seen it, kind of out at a concert on his own, yeah. somewhat seemingly crazy, possibly on some substances, <laughs> possibly. Yeah. And then the second person who stands up, the first shirtless dancing man, instead of just continuing to dance by himself, he really embraces that person. Right, he grabs his hands, he twirls him around, and all of a sudden they're in it together. Mm -hmm. And then a couple more people stand up and a few more. And as you point out, once everyone else is doing it, you kind of have to. And so soon the whole hill is just dancing together. So in movements, it's about embracing those first few people and also often giving them a role to play that is somewhat significant. So there's an example that I love here, um, a woman named Jennifer Cardenas, who she started a group in the during Hurricane Harvey, like in the heat of it, when everybody was evacuating, she lived in Houston. A, f- a group in real life online? A Facebook group. Okay, she started Facebook a Facebook group. group. No, don't be ashamed to put the brand. <laughs> We're at <laughs> Facebook right now. It's allowed. She started a Facebook group, and here's what happened. So she just invited her friends and family. Then she went to dinner, and there were 800 people who had asked to join the group. She went to bed, and the next morning while they were evacuating, 30,000 people oh had asked to join this group. And over the next couple of days, it grew to 150,000 people. And Jennifer really embraced the other people who had joined her. 80 different people volunteered to be moderators of the group. Wow. They ended yeah. up pulling in the different expertise of the individuals. So some people had been through previous natural disasters and had spreadsheets they could use. Some people were members of the Coast Guard and they pulled in people to actually start helping coordinate rescues. Jennifer herself ended up losing internet access. So she's the leader of this movement. She can't even get into the group. So anticlimactic. Right. But the amazing thing is because she had embraced those early followers, she didn't need to. There were all these people who could do it on her behalf when she wasn't there, and they ended up rescuing 8,000 people oh my from Hurricane Harvey. And it didn't descend into cha- – the Facebook group didn't descend into chaos. Not at all. Yeah. I mean, pe- because all these people had volunteered to moderate it, it not only was it successful during the hurricane, but that group is still engaged, and now they're helping each other manage through forms they have to fill out for FEMA Insurance. and yeah. exactly all of that. When you see a group with that kind of growth, is there a little – alert that goes off in someone's computer here in the office. It's like, hey, this thing is really popular. We should probably look at it and make sure everything is... Um, We do have various alerts for all different kinds of metrics. You might imagine, though, that we have a lot of groups, tens of millions of them. And so there are a lot of them that actually grow like this very quickly. Um, Yes, they don't all do that. Some, you know, I say... um, that running a community is sort of like being a great host of a party. You know, you have to give it some love and attention to make mm-hmm. it work. You have to invite people and introduce them to each other and so forth. Um, but but there are many, many examples of groups that really take off like really? this when they resonate with people. What kind of group, am I allowed to ask this? What kind of groups have, have you seen where you're like, wow, who would have thought? You remember Beanie Babies? Yeah. Like if that was coexisted at the same time as Facebook, there would be a huge Beanie Baby group That's that right. pops up overnight. That's right? right. I mean, there are really, honestly, there are huge groups on pretty much everything you can imagine. This is one of my favorite things about this is that 
There are groups on the things that are that people are really struggling with in their lives. There's huge groups for people who have someone in their family affected by addiction or mm -hmm. themselves. There's groups for people who are adopted to like find and connect to other <laughs> people who are adopted. How else would you find that yeah, except online? And then like every passionate hobby you can imagine. My one of my favorites is called Lady Bikers of California. <laughs> but there's also a Lady Bikers group in Italy. There's one in India. There's one in like most are you of the a lady states. Biker, or you just... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a you lady biker. You don't seem biker. like a type, but you never I'm know. Not, in fact, not only am I not a lady biker, but there's a story in Purposeful about me not learning to ride a bike, a bicycle, until my 20s, which is pretty embarrassing. A little. Yeah. Um, but yeah. hey, you threw it at Now you're owning it. That's right. Yeah. And I still fell off a lot, which was extra embarrassing. But like these lady bikers, they, you know, they felt really alone at first, right? Because they were often the only ones. They'd be out there on the, you know, biking on the road by themselves. Some of them say, like, they had things thrown at them. Oh, and that's They were name-called. Right. Yeah. But now that they find each other, now they connect online, and they also, like, go riding together all the time. And so they feel empowered and the sense of belonging, and that's part of why these groups grow as quickly as they do. Jen, how many people are in women in beekeeping on Facebook. <laughs> I could look it up. Yeah. But honestly, there are there are and like the um She's are you in a, a women in beekeeping? Oh yeah, women in beekeeping. Oh my god, how many people are in it? Oh, I don't know, but a lot. Yes. A lot. I love that. Right. So whatever like interesting <laughs> or unusual hobby you you yeah. have, there are pe other people. I never thought too. to to look for it. And when I saw women in beekeeping, I was like, what is it? There's probably 15 people in there. <laughs> from NorCal who have hives. Right. You can't post something and then check back in an hour in it without scrolling. That's amazing. Because there's so many videos of, of only women keeping bees in there. Right. And I, I, I asked, of course, why isn't it just beekeeping? And she goes, the guys are dicks. <laughs> They're so mean to each other. Yeah. I thought, okay, yeah. I mean, there are groups of blended groups. gender. And then there of are course. also some groups that are just guys. One of my favorites is called the Missing Chins, which is a group of guys that run together and or just encourage each other while okay. they're running. And they've lost so much weight that oh, the they chins. call themselves the Missing Chins. I they've lost it. like thousands of pounds together. That's so. cool. That's really interesting. I'm waiting for, well, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Let's go back to the book, shall we? <laughs> okay. Um, stopping the hater raid, using criticism as an advantage. Because I, you mentioned earlier that there was a critical member who got that video for Virgin to go forward. Yeah. I think most people are worried about there being somebody who's critical in the other direction, who yeah. says, you know, this is a freaking FAA safety video. No one's paying attention. We can make it for five grand or we can make it for 150 Pick the cheap one, man. Yeah. Why are you in my office? Yeah. Well, what I say about criticism, first of all, you should expect it, right? I say it's part of the package. Like the more successful you become on your path to growing a movement, the more likely you are to face criticism. Mm -hmm. And first, I suggest that people separate it into two buckets because I, I've talked to a lot of people who've both started movements, also celebrities and so forth. And like there's a set of feedback that is about things that are outside of your control, like your gender, your appearance, your race, et cetera. And I try to tell people to just set that aside and not let that kind of feedback get you down. Um, there are other ways to handle that kind of feedback, too, that have to deal with giving extra love and understanding, because the truth is people don't behave that way without a reason, right? Yeah. Like people are not born haters and trolls. Pe normal um, people don't throw things at women riding motorcycles. That's right. That's and not so, a normal person behavior. Well, I guess what I'd say is normal, not normal, like that is probably coming from a position of some kind of right. pain and yeah. trauma. And so there, there is a path, and I talk about this in the book, I call it the bear hug um, of like trying to understand the people that hate you mm -hmm. and why. And actually, maybe I'll tell one story about sure. that because um, – we had a situation at change.org right after I started there where we were getting spammed by a, a guy in Spain who would put fake signatures on the petition, take pictures of them, and then tweet them out to the press. Well, and, fake signature? Like, I mean, he would, put, yeah, he could put a name that was like obviously fake. And the way that our system worked was that any bulk signatures would get taken down immediately. Individual, you know, supposedly fake signatures like that usually would could take up to 24 hours. Yeah, to how are you going to find 
right, see so, more butts on a petition. Right. So I, we do. I, we did find them, but it, we didn't take them down immediately. And so it was possible to do this thing where you would screenshot and tweet to the press. He just wanted to discredit your organization. Exactly. And so we were, you know, brainstorming, like, what do you do when you have a kind of hater like yeah. this? And we had all these tech solutions in mind. And our then VP of comms said, why don't we try the bear hug? Mm. And well, what is the bear hug? And he says, well, why don't I fly to Spain yeah. and just like Punch go him meet with him? No. Oh, so I'm just <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, that was option B. I yeah. Thought. Yeah. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. Um, no, just like listen to him, see what he has to say. We'll give him an oversized dose of love mm-hmm. instead of, you know, because the other, the other ideas were like block his IP address, but then he goes to a new one and so forth. So, you know, I said, okay, well, it's worth a shot. It was a little bit of like a boondoggle trip to Spain, potentially, sure. but I, I didn't have a better idea. Okay, so. we get it. You want to go to Spain. Right. So we flew him to Spain, and he went and flew out to this tiny island where this guy happened to live. And, you know, they talked about it. And he explained kind of the way our system worked at a high level. You don't mm-hmm. usually give all the details to a imagine. spammer. Yes. Um, yeah. And... It turns out that the person who was doing this really cared about this one petition. Mm-hmm. And he was worried that there might be fake signatures on it. And so he wanted to prove whether or not it was possible. And it wasn't that he actually hated our organization. It was that he really cared about this one thing. Hmm. And so when we understood that and when he understood the way our system worked, all of a sudden I'm getting like text messages with, you know, pictures of them with their arms around each other. They're drinking beers together. And then, you know, he's not spamming us anymore. So a little bit of love and understanding can sometimes go a long way with haters. Unfortunately, that was a really expensive spammer I mean, <laughs> in terms of time and it's true but it was actually way less expensive to do that than it would have been to take say five or ten engineers and put them oh, on the technical yeah. solution against it yeah, yeah following m- this much guy cheaper. around the internet right. to make sure he doesn't write stupid things on exactly. twitter exactly interesting and then the, there's this other set of, of things which you mentioned before about using criticism to your advantage mm-hmm. which has to do with trying to realize that people who are criticizing us may have something of value to offer us. So there's a great quote that I love from Ken Blanchard that says, even the best athletes in the world have coaches. Like they are the best at their craft and even they don't believe that they have all the answers. I'm a huge proponent of this. Right. Whenever I interview somebody who's really great at something, they always have four coaches exactly, or 10 Right. For each of these sub skills. That's right. And so, you know, when you think to yourself, well, you know, if Michael Jordan's coach didn't probably shoot a better free throw than he did, Mm -hmm. but he still added a lot of value. If you can kind of see your critics as potential coaches, people who might make you better, it actually can can let you use that criticism to your advantage. And there's a great story um, in the book about a woman named Mary Lou Jepsen who. Yeah. Yeah. She she was just on my show. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh And I was going to ask if you knew her. Love her. Yeah. Um, yeah. She's one of like the smartest technical minds in the world. Yeah. Unbelievable. Right. Yeah. And so one of her early projects, I don't know if you guys talked about this, but the one laptop per child. Yes. So she was building these solar powered, light readable, super inexpensive laptops only. Impossible to make. Right. Everybody yeah. thought they were impossible. Did she tell you this story? Yeah. This was my friend Rob Reed did the interview uh, on his show called After On. And okay. it was, it started with that. And then we talked or they talked about the imaging technology and things that right. are going to be reading our dreams, which is exactly. a little terrifying, but also really cool. Right. But yeah, they, everything everyone said was you can't, and this is years before you and I would even have a right. laptop because it was ridiculous. Right. Why would I need to bring a computer with me anywhere? Exactly. And she said, no, we're going to make these really cheap portable devices right. that work on, I don't know, sunlight and, and right. rainbows or something. That's and right. she did it. Well, the interesting thing is how she did it. She says she went out to visit one of the biggest tech companies in Asia and she met with all their executives and she did the pitch about this and they said, Oh no, there's 23 reasons why this won't work. Mm -hmm. And so she said she took notes and then she said, well, I think I have solutions for 17 of these things. Why don't I go back and like try to fix the rest and then I'll come back and you can tell me more things that might not work about my product. And so instead of seeing them as critics, she basically leverage them to debug her product right, yeah, to where she could make it possible. QAing like, exactly. my entire idea exactly. in an hour. And so if you think about it that way, 
then those people who are criticizing you may just find things that actually you should change about your product. How can we tell the difference between somebody who's giving us coachable feedback versus somebody who's really just trying to demotivate because of their own stuff? Because we have, it's, it's obvious when you're looking at this person threw a beer bottle at me while I was biking down the right. road. That's really obvious. What if we're in an office situation and someone says, yeah, you know, this really isn't in the budget. We can't do this. But really, the reason is they're so pissed that a, a woman got promoted over them that they're never going to let you do anything. Yeah. So I'd say two things here. One is that similar to managers and movement starters, there's two types of people in organizations. This is another Ken Blanchardism that mm-hmm. I love. He, he talks about eagles versus ducks. And he says there are ducks, people who are ducks, they kind of sit on the surface and they see only what's immediately around them and they quack all the time. Mm -hmm. Like the rules say quack, quack, we can't quack, quack, my budget, quack, quack, quack. And then there are eagles who fly above, see the big picture, use their judgment and kind of see past rules to what might be possible. And so if you're facing someone who's just really duck-like, then I would suggest just moving them to the side. The type of feedback you want is critical feedback that helps you make what you're doing better, not just continues to quack at you. The other thing I've found in interviewing, again, so many people is that having allies and supporters is really helpful. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you're not sure if someone's a duck or an eagle, you can go to your other, you know, people who are allies in your movement and say, I heard this thing. What do you think? And just get some perspective from other people. Right. So, oh, did Tom tell you that? Yeah, he's never. He had the same thing with me five years ago, and he'll eventually leave you alone. Yeah. Right. Got it. That makes sense. How do we identify the people? You mentioned allies. How do, we, how do we identify the right people where we go, okay, this person's going to end up being critical potentially to my idea, or yes, I have to get the head of the flight attendant right. yeah. training people on board with this video. How do we find those people? There's got to be some strategy. to. Yeah. The, again, this gets back to influence mapping. I think right. so. you basically, most movements have a decision maker, one or more people who mm. have the power to do the thing you want changed. Sometimes it's your CEO. Sometimes it's elected officials. Sometimes it's the head of your school. You know, whoever it is that they're the person that has the power understanding both who motivates them, like who influences them, Mm -hmm. and also what are the things that motivate them really matter. So I tell a story about an experience I had early in my career where I did this badly and like learn from those. So basically when early in in my uh, career at Yahoo, I was responsible for leading marketing for what was then Yahoo Search, which (laughs) we were trying to fight back against Google after we had kind of lost all the market share in search. Mm -hmm. And we had to run this, not that we had to, we wanted to run a big marketing campaign because we thought this would help us um, let people know why the product, we had had rebuilt the product and it was much better and we wanted to let people know. Um, but there was a decision maker whose approval I needed on the budget and I just did not do a good job of getting his approval. I was nervous because he had so much power and I had sometimes seen him, um, not be super nice to people when they asked him for things. And so instead of like really thinking about what he cared about and how I could effectively persuade him, I just delayed and delayed Mm -hmm. until it was the very last minute. And I essentially boxed him into a corner because I needed his approval to launch the thing like the next few days, which was not a good, not at all a good recommendation. No, he did not. Um, And, Later, it, you know, it all turned out okay. I tell the rest of the story where I went to explain to him the results of this campaign. And he started out by saying, this was a horrible idea and we spent way too much money on it, which was a little rough. It's a great start to any meeting. (laughs) It's like, okay. Um, but as it turns out, the data was really clear in my presentation that this marketing campaign had led to increased market share, which was worth tens of millions of dollars. I bet that you were glad to be able to deliver that news. Right. And yeah. he was also, and at the end he said, boy, I'm sorry, you, you know, you, I was wrong. You put oh. me wrong. But it was one of those moments where I realized 
how hard it is yeah. to sit in that seat, right? I had not been a decision maker on a big budget item before. And now that, of course, I do that all the time, I realize how much more we can help those people make the decisions by empowering them with the data they need, by persuading other people who might influence them to make it easier for them to say yes. So there's a whole section in the book about making it easy to say yes and kind of the combination of data and storytelling and understanding the people that matter to that person are all key. Great. Okay, so now that we have heard some of your bungles, <laughs> you must work with people all the time where, where you say, look, all right, I've been in your shoes, here's what went wrong, or maybe you're, maybe you're not that nice at the time, but maybe it comes out later, I don't know. I'm try what I wanted to ask in some way or another is, what are the common mistakes you see from people that are working under you where you go, man, if this person had just done this in a different way or all young people who are working in my departments continually do this thing, how do we tr get rid of this bad habit? Yeah, I guess what I'd say is that in working in a lot of different organizations, what I tend to see is that people have different strengths, mm -hmm. right? So some people are really super analytical and they're great at presenting data. Other people are much better at you know, painting a vision and a, a picture and a story of what it could be. And the best, um, the people who are the most successful are the ones who either can get well-rounded themselves or can put together teams of people that are well-rounded. So I might, if someone's presenting something to me and it is lacking data, I will just ask, you know, can you show me? Where's the beef? Yeah, yeah. some, you know, I need to understand more about the metrics of what might happen if we <laughs> launch this. Um, and generally, again, I tend to view myself as a coach the same way I view my critics as coaches to me. I tend to view myself as a coach to my team. And this comes from my experience as a coxswain on the crew team in high school and really? college. Okay. So I, for people who don't know, you know, in a rowing team, there's a role called a coxswain. So coxswains, they sit in the boat, they steer, they strategize the race because you can see how many strokes per minute the team is taking, mm -hmm. you pace them, and you also coach and motivate the rowers to push themselves harder than they think they can and, you know, to do that correctly so that they win the race. And I learned pretty quickly that, you know, if someone's oar is going in at the wrong angle or too slow or too fast, you have to give them feedback. If you don't give them feedback at that moment in real time, and in this case, unfortunately, in front of everyone else, then you'll lose, yeah. right? And yeah, you so, can't pull someone aside on that little boat. Right. And so in, at work, it's always good to pull someone aside. Sure. But even when you can't, the thing that I learned over time is that different people are motivated in different ways. And so I actually practiced this outside of the boat. They have these rowing machines, and it was my job to coach them each on the erg, wow. it's called. And I would find that different techniques worked with different people. So some people, like, they wanted it really direct or, like, competitive, like, that's too, you'll never make it. Yeah. It's not good enough. Talk you know, to me much, like my dad talks Exactly. To me. <laughs> yeah. And then other people wanted, like, really positive, encouraging feedback. Mm. Like, that's awesome. You're doing so great. Just a little bit more. Yeah, three degrees right. Exactly. Yeah. And so then when we were in the boat, I knew what was the right thing to say to each person. And that made it easier for them to take the feedback. And that is true at work as well. I think a lot of managers think they have to calibrate to my management style, yeah. not I have to calibrate my management style style to the way that my team functions. That's right. And I, what I would say is you will be more effective if you can do the <laughs> yeah. latter. And it's, not everyone will hate you like they probably do now if that's how you currently <laughs> operate. Yeah. I mean, there are, I think it is reasonable to set expectations that you expect people to deliver, mm -hmm. but that's about, you know, setting again, clear vision and goals and getting everyone rowing in the same direction. But then how they want to do that or be motivated around that really is different. And I created a tool. Um, there's a link to it on my website. We'll link to it in the show notes. Yeah, great. It's called, it called the Motivational Pie Chart. Oh, nice. And basically right. I learned because everyone's motivated in different ways, now I just ask them. 
And so I give everybody I work with an empty circle and I say, fill it up with the things that matter to you at work. And they can make them, they can use as many categories as they want. So then they weight them the size of which pie chart matters most. And then they color code them red, yellow, and green, how we're doing against those factors. And I did this initially because a woman on my team came up to me once and said, if I ever do a good job, just pay me more money. (laughs) <laughs> and I was like, what? That I was so shocked by that. Yeah, that's very blunt. Right. Yeah. She just said, I don't really care about recognition and I just want more money, like a spot bonus or something is what will make me happy. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized I would never, ever have guessed that if she mm-hmm. hadn't told me. So I just started asking people. And now after decades of using the pie chart, I've learned two things. One is... There are a lot of unique things that come up that you wouldn't guess about people if you didn't ask them. The other thing is there's three things that show up on almost every single pie chart. What are they? They are purpose or meaning. People want to know that they're working on something that matters and they want to know how what they do connects to that purpose. The second one is growth. People want to feel like they're learning and growing in their job, that they're being challenged, et cetera. And I think the main reason why people leave jobs is they feel like they're not learning anymore. Mm -hmm. And the third is connection. They want to work with people they like and trust and respect. And so there's a chapter um, in Purposeful called Lead Your Crew, and it breaks down into these three categories and basically says even if you're – whether you're leading a team at work or you're leading a movement as a social organizer, those same three categories are what really matters. How do we stay motivated or what do we do when we go through all these steps? I've got the book. I've read the whole thing. I went through the workbook that doesn't exist yet and Jordan's worksheets, which (laughs) don't exist yet. And then it falls on its face or it doesn't t- it doesn't get off the runway. Or, of course, if I readily – if I made some obvious mistake, oh, I didn't do the influence mapping, that, that was a huge fail. What happens if we just don't have enough lift? Yeah. So I, I guess here the thing to remember is movements don't happen overnight. Mm-hmm. So first I say expect that there will be some ups and downs. And I describe this as mountain climbing. It's kind of like some days are super sunny and you yeah. brought a picnic lunch and other days are really cloudy and you you know you have like a backpack that weighs 50 times your body weight. Um The key is to keep yourself climbing on both of those days and to remember that there will be those ups and downs. Um, Part of what helps there is also having a team of people you're working with. The other thing that I've seen be really successful in keeping momentum going is new stories that you bring into the mix. So sometimes what you see is like you'll have initial success and then it'll feel like it kind of flattens out. And what I see happen is there, if people can bring a new story into the mix, it can reignite it. So an example here, and this this one is not in the book, um, but there's a woman named Katie Bethel who started an organization called PLUS, which stands for Parental Leave US. She's on a, a um, campaign to get companies and the government in the US to offer fairer to offer some parental leave, which our government doesn't do, as you I know. Did not well actually it didn't. I don't yeah, we are today, so. we are one of only three countries in the world that doesn't offer parental leave as so, part of the law. Oh really? Okay. I just assume because every company that I know Yeah that I that you hear about anyway right. has it. Around here Around that's here. true, but most of the country that's not true. That's insane. And so people will often have to go back to work like days after giving birth. That you sounds know, do, horribly uncomfortable right. and really Slight, difficult and, and unsafe yeah. to both the mother and the child. And so Katie is is on a mission to change that. And she's d- doing it really effectively because she keeps new stories coming into the mix. So they will work with um, people who are employees of certain companies and get them to tell their stories and then go to the company and try to persuade them. They've effectively done that with both Starbucks and Walmart at this point. And then anytime there's kind of a flattening out, she'll find a new story. She'll raise a awareness about a new thing. And that's what helps keep this going. It's going to be a long fight. It's not like yeah. this is something you change, you know, in Ch- a week or a day. Changing labor laws right. is you're going against the people with the most money in the whole country and you're trying to affect change through bureaucracy, like through the government. I mean, good luck, via con Dios, when that's that, right. anything in that department. And I, I do believe that they will yeah. be successful, but it's going to be, you know, it's going to take a while and it's going to yeah. take lots of pieces along the way. The other thing I'd say is that sometimes you may just be on the wrong path. And I, I tell a story also about my own startup that 
you know, we changed the name twice. We changed the product three times. Like sometimes the idea you have actually isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be willing to do what we call in startup land, the pivot. Yes. (laughs) Um, And change your approach. Ideally, your mission doesn't change. So the vision that you set for your movement, what you want to change and why stays consistent, but how you go about it, you may need to shift that approach. Sure. Yeah. The listeners are very familiar with pivoting. (laughs) In Silicon Valley, of course, that's like, you hear that word every single day. And you think of companies like Slack that spent 10 years trying to make a video game or something like that. And then the only function that was working properly was the chat feature. Well, you and know, that's how Flickr got started, too. So I did Stuart not Stuart Butterfield, who started both Flickr and Slack, tried to start a multi, a massive multiplayer online game both mm-hmm. times. Oh, poor guy. And, well, and he's... Yeah. he's poor billionaire. Right. <laughs> he's been successful both times in starting something else, so... Yeah, good for him in that. And I... Um, so, by the way, before y'all ask me, we're going to post an excerpt from the book that has information about influence mapping and hopefully in the future a couple of resources about that because... I like that idea. Being able to pinpoint who's actually the right person to to influence so that they can influence someone else, I guess, is, exactly. is a priceless set of skills. All right. What I'm waiting for Facebook to do, and I know this isn't necessarily your department, I want to post a picture of myself and have it go, here's everyone in the world that looks like you. <laughs> when is that coming? I don't know, but that's an interesting idea. Right? Because there's got to be some people that look the just doppelganger. Like me. Yeah. I've actually, I have one because people told me that I have one and sent me her picture. It's yeah. quite, quite amusing. Yeah, I've, I've definitely met people that look and have other people go, "Is that you?" And I'm like, "No, but that looks so much like me." Who is that guy? I don't know. He's at an airport, but he has a Facebook profile for sure. Mm. Right? Same height, same weight, similar face. I even showed my mom a picture of this guy that somebody sent me, and she goes, w- did you get your eyebrow pierced? And I'm like, it's not even me. It's some other guy. Oh, that's great. Well, yeah. we'll take that feedback. Let's do it. Yeah. Yeah. How hard can it be, right? It's, uh, remember those apps that gave you guys all that trouble? There's, they do have useful applications. I promise. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks so much for having me.